uh, I guess it's potent. Yeah, if you don't like this, look away, because it makes some people sick. But you can see that there's a shimmering thing going on there. Uh, that's the result of lateral inhibition. I don't have the time to explain the details of that, but uh, it's, it's something that affects us all the time. Okay. And if we're going to build networks of neurons that make sense, we need the networks to do behavior like this, and we need to be able to explain it. OK, so um, there are interesting things also going on uh, with the uh, T receptors that are summing up timing information. There's also convergence. And the convergence in this case gives you electrical, uh, gives you temporal summation. And because I feel like I'm a little bit running out of time, I'll, um, I'll try to explain this, but maybe a bit briefly. Everybody says that, right? They say, oh, I'm running out of time. I'm going to skip these slides. And then they go over every slide. I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, <laughs> so, um, um, so this is useful to see this trace also. So this is a, a trace from a, a, a T receptor. And uh, excuse me, this is from the um, first stage of processing uh, in, in the brain. Uh, it has a name, too, spherical cells. But it's the first stage of processing in the central nervous system. And here is a recording. And this recording, unlike the previous recordings, it's not the electrode is just close by, and it's outside of or extracellular to the cell. In this recording, a very fine glass micropipette was drawn, so it could actually pierce inside of the cell, but doing it in a way so that the cell remains still reasonably healthy. And so you can now record not only the potentials when the cell spikes, but also the sub-threshold potentials, all the, or some of the potentials going into the cell that lead up to the decision to spike. So that's called an intracellular recording. And it provides you with a lot more information about the network than just an extracellular recording for that one cell. Okay. But they're much harder to do. So, um, so here you see these little blips here. Those are called, again, terminology, I apologize, postsynaptic potentials or potentials on the other, on the, this cell side of the synapse, these are the sub-threshold inputs to the cell. Okay? And you see that for a very weak stimulus, it's going up and down, uh, electric field. You see a lot of these postsynaptic potentials, but they're not terribly reliable. And the cell rarely spikes. Now you increase the amplitude of the signal a bit, and you start seeing more and taller uh, PSPs, postsynaptic potentials, and the cell occasionally spikes. And then at some point, you start seeing lots of spikes and still remaining few PSPs at the right place, but the cell didn't spike there. And then if you increase the stimulus a little bit more, then the cell becomes very reliable. And it's up in this range, which is behaviorally relevant. And this results from summation of multiple receptors onto this one cell. So this is temporal summation yielding to, uh, 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 leading to uh, a reliable uh, signal. And this temporal summation con continues throughout the nervous system. So if you now go to a higher area in the brain and you look, compare the activity in that higher area relative to the activity at this first area, you see that the variance of the signal in the higher area, the temporal variance of the signal, is much lower than in the, in, than in the initial stage of processing. Okay. So um, uh, that means that there's still an analog calculation being done here, which is pretty remarkable. And at that point, it gets converted to a digital code. That is, the output of the cell at this uh, point in time signals that there was a timing event here. But it's not the analog. It's not the, the time of the spike is not related to the exact time of when the stimulus occurred on a cycle by cycle basis. OK. So let's solve uh, the last problem um, uh, that we need to solve in these animals and then move on to uh, a few other comments. Okay? So we still haven't talked about the one, you know, the one uh, 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 big question, which is how do the animals solve this uh, comparison across different parts of the body surface? Okay? So in the amplitude domain, uh, the signal amplitude domain, this isn't a big problem. In the phase domain, this is where we found our problem, and here we'll find our solution. So the lower levels of the initial stages of the uh, time pathway project onto this structure called the torus. Uh, 
just a, a name, uh, this particular uh, region or layer or lamina in the torus, whereas the amplitude pathways doesn't project into that lamina, it projects onto different lamina. And uh, do I have a, yeah, and um, uh, the, it, it's organized in the following way. The input from these uh, uh, first level uh, processing uh, area uh, goes on to uh, giant cells and small cells. And the projection onto the small cells is topographic, meaning that a receptor here projects onto uh, a small cell here. A receptor close to the first one projects to a small cell nearby to that first small cell. So that's topographic. As you move along the body surface, you move along the position of the small cells. That's just preservation of topography, right? But the giant cells branch out within the lamina and send their axons all over the place and, and connect onto other small cells. The small cells get two input, one from below and one from the giant cells in their lamina. And the input from the giant cells in the lamina can be from a lot of different places. So the small cell, the other input the small cell is getting is some input from the other part of the body surface. That's the basis for making the calculation between the two parts of the body surface. So there's an anatomical basis for this. And you can uh, uh, imagine why it's useful to preserve the analog signal up to this level of the brain. Okay. Anyway, I'll stop there with electric fish. I hope there have been lots of examples that have given you some sense of uh, how we would go about this problem. Um, and I want to spend the last couple of minutes talking about um, um, uh, single neurons. This has all been to introduce you to the concept of networks, right? Uh, how cells contribute to networks and how networks contribute to behavior. But we need to know something about cells too, okay? Single neurons. And I'm only going to say a little bit about it because I think for the purposes of both my talks uh, and uh, Henry's, you don't need to know that much. But remember again, cells are living things. There's an enormous amount of complexity inside each one of them, and it's amazing. Okay? So the, uh, they're very, very, very sophisticated computational devices. So all the uh, um, um, uh, all the network calculations that use uh, simple cells or simple versions of neurons uh, to do calculations, they're perfectly valid. They, that is, they are potentially useful simplifications. They allow you to do computation or, or uh, theory uh, that you otherwise not, might not be able to do. And it's not that they're not valid, but they're not accurate. They're not biologically accurate. And uh, it'd be nice to develop networks with biologically realistic neurons. Okay? That's what our goal is here in this exercise. So the first thing you need to know about uh, uh, cells is that they have um, voltages across them. So they have a cell membrane, right? That's what defines the cell. It has a cell membrane. And then you can measure a voltage inside the cell relative to outside the cell. Do you know what you call a cell that doesn't have such a voltage across its cell membrane? You call it dead. Okay? All cells have such uh, voltages. Now, neurons are special because, as we talked about, they have these uh, regenerating, uh, uh, they get inputs, electrical, or inputs from other cells that have these electrical properties, and they send an output, which is an action potential. But this is all the movement of ions across the cell membrane, which is regulated in uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, uh, complex set of, of mechanisms that we're just going to touch upon. So the regulation is done by there are lots of things you could measure. The two things you want to measure in particular are the movement of ions across voltage-gated channels. Ooh, what does that mean? Well, channels are pores in the cell body, right? Voltage-gated means that as the voltage across the cell body, uh, the cell membrane, excuse me, changes, the channels might open or close. They might be in uh, uh, an inactivated state. They, that is, they can, there's a complexity to the process that Again, we don't need to talk about the details, but you should know it exists. Um, and there are different types of ions that flow across the cell body. And these ion channels can be specific 
They, there are ion channel types that are specific for, say, the flow of calcium or the flow of, of potassium or the flow of, of, of sodium and so on and so forth. Okay. So you can see we're starting to develop quite a bit of complexity at the level. Visualize these things, these things? Oh, yeah. There's, oh. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. There's, so you can really see this stuff now it's, experimentally? It's amazing what they can do nowadays. It's okay. beautiful. It's really, yes, yes. You can record from single channels. We know a lot about the structure. You'll see in a moment. You'll see in a moment. Now, the, the, there's also signals inside the cell that are very important. And the one that is certainly the most important or that drives lots of other processes which will affect these uh, resting, these action potentials and the way signals are summated and so on is the concentration of calcium, the inside or internal or intracellular concentration of calcium. That'll drive a lot of processes inside of the cell. Okay. So in fact, to answer your question slightly better, um, uh, we know a lot. They know a lot. I'm not a molecular uh, uh, biologist, but uh, uh, we as a field know a lot about the structure of these different types of channels, including the voltage-gated uh, ion channels. They, they span the cell membrane from, uh, from the outside, uh, excuse me, from the inside to the outside. Uh, they have uh, uh, five domains that span it and four units. And we could talk, you know, a whole quarter's worth of lectures about this. It's pretty fascinating. You, there's actually a molecular phylogeny uh, of the different classes, and there are hundreds or thousands of them, hundreds in any case. So there are different classes of voltage-gated uh, ion channels, like for sodium, like for uh, protons, like for, uh, these are trip channels, these are uh, calcium channels and uh, potassium channels and so on and so forth. Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, potassium-gated calcium channels and, and so on and so forth. Um, and there's a whole complexity. And in general, um, um, here's the problem that we want to do. We want to understand networks as collections of neurons. The constraints are we can measure a smallish number of extracellular spikes uh, at one moment in time. Um, and that's a hard thing to do, but we can do it in the context of an animal behaving. And so that's an incredibly powerful approach. And it's led to most of what we know about functional neurobiology. Uh, the functional uh, uh, properties of networks, uh, neural networks. Uh, we have typically, when we do these recordings, some knowledge, if somewhat limited knowledge, of the different cell types uh, and the local connections between those different cell types. Okay. Um, what we'd like to be able to do is measure the intracellular calcium of populations of cells. We can do that. That turns out to be of somewhat limited value, but we can do that. Or what we'd really like to do is measure the intracellular voltage of hundreds and thousands of cells simultaneously. And typically, we can do one at a time in most preparations. In some preparations, the, the reduced preparations, we can do two or three or four. This is a bit of a problem. Uh, but um, um, and we have um, you know, various other problems. One of them is we have limited knowledge of the different classes of ion channels that a particular uh, uh, cell type will have. Um, and so oftentimes we need to make guesses about that too. So this is a pretty hard problem, right? You know, we have. Stupid question. No, I'm sure it's you can't. Cells and neurons. <laughs> so neurons are a collection of cells? Or? Neuron is just a cell, is a more generic term. There are cells that are not neurons, but so all neurons, neurons are. Cells are a special type of cell. Of cell, right. Right, there can be cells in the pancreas or in the liver right. yeah, or the skin so or so on. Okay. The brain cells, brain well, I cells. I thought always neurons are more like a collection of cells. No, it's, it's just a so cell. a collection of cells is a population of neurons. Yeah, okay. uh, it's so just a neuron is a cell. It's a yeah, brain okay. cell. And there are, there are cells in the brain that are not neurons that do various other things. They're called yeah, glia. Sure. Sure. I mean, I but yeah. right. Um, OK. Um, so anyway, there's all this amazing complexity. And you know. Uh, Henry has the audacity to want to build uh, networks of these things and make them work, right? But there's all this stuff we don't know about, right? So, you know, should we give up? Well, obviously we shouldn't give up, right? Because what have I told you that uh, um, um, tells us that we, we have some hope to, to succeed here? First of all, neuroethology is powerful. So you saw one example now. In the next talk, you'll see another example. Uh, and you can start seeing how you can look at 
sufficiently complicated behavior uh, that uh, it's not quite maybe human cognition, but it's, it's, it's interesting enough that it will, it will uh, motivate you. Okay? And we can look at that from a neurothological perspective. Um, but we actually have a lot more going for us than that. So the intracellular activity is complex. And complexity can yield to constraints, and that's valuable for us. It's different from uh, between diff cells from different classes, right? So the intracellular activity of a neuron that projects to this part of the brain might be different than it projects to that part of the brain, might be different from a neuron that doesn't project except locally. So difference between projection neurons and so-called interneurons, OK? It's reliable within a cell class. And it's man amenable to manipulation by pharmacology. So these are tough experiments, but you can actually put on these very specific drugs to block one particular type of receptor or channel while leaving the others uh, alone. And by that, figure out a lot of details of how the cell might respond when you give a uh, current pulse. It might give this type of response, so very f uh, f uh, fast to, uh, a number of spikes that are close to each other at first that slowly adapt or it waits a while and then gives a few spikes, or it gives very no spikes at all with what we call a so-called sag current here, and then gives spikes after you stop the stimulus, so-called rebound excitation. There's a lot of complexity here. And, it's, and it derives from the properties of the uh, uh, channels, the voltage-gated channels and the calcium-sensitive uh, channels inside the cell. So we can learn something about this, right? And furthermore, um, there's a general formulation for how we treat all this. So this is a very generic form of the so-called Hodgkin-Huxley uh, formulation. So these uh, uh, two gentlemen uh, um, got a Nobel Prize for this work uh, in Cambridge. Uh, they did their work in Cambridge in 1953. Uh, and as it turns out, I was born in Cambridge in 1953. Because my dad was a biochemist, too, and he was uh, there when they were doing this work. It was kind of interesting. Um, at a personal level. So um, you can see that the, uh, the, the capacitance of the cell membrane uh, is related to the change in the voltage as a function of time. Uh, you can think of it as the summation uh, of the uh, uh, currents that uh, arise from a variety of these different voltage-gated uh, channels. Uh, which we designate here as I, right? So we sum over I. And each one of the current from each one of these uh, channels is just by Ohm's law related to, uh, we don't write resistance, we write conductance, so one over resistance. So this is the conductance of that channel, uh, which is also a function of the time and the voltage, and uh, it depends on the, uh, it's voltage gated, right? So it depends on how far the, uh, uh, the mem, the, um, potential across the cell is from the resting potential, or the equilibrium potential, as it's written here. Okay. And then these things, these conductances, now we get down to the individual channels. They have uh, some complexity to their representations. It's, um, there's, uh, in terms of, remember, I mentioned, at least in passing, the animal, the animal, the channels can be in different states like they could be uh, uh, in a state of activation or inactivation, and so we have to take that into account. And that creates, uh, for the different channels, they have different kinetics uh, for these uh, uh, effects. And so uh, for the, describe these properties for the different channels. And so we, we describe that this way, where P and Q are small number integers, one, two, three, and so on. Um, uh, and those will vary depending on the channel type. So now we can start building uh, a model that incorporates all this information for all the channel types we know for the cell. Um, and here's an example of something we did a few years ago. Um, and uh, there are 70, I looked around, I don't think there's 71. Uh, there are 70 free parameters in this model. Okay? And this, you know, I looked at this and I went, well, it was good for, it's so 2014. Uh, we can do much better than this now. Uh, but that's because we've learned more. But nevertheless, we learned good things uh, making a model like this. And it's clear that there are lots of parameters that need to be estimated. It's clear that we now have a handle on how to do this uh, 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 experimentally by injecting different currents into the cell, measuring their outputs. Uh, and then seeing if we can build models that uh, both uh, fit the response of the cell very well and then predict the response of the cell to other currents uh, 
Um, and, and so that's the, the, um, that's the enterprise uh, that we're going to be embarking upon. So this is a single cell? This is just a model for one cell. One okay. cell. There's the voltage of the cell. Um, and we're going to try to build a model that does a useful description, a good description of how that cell responds to different inputs. Right. And if we could do that for a lot of different classes of cells, then we could hook up those equations together, uh, which is the same thing as making connections between the cells, and start building networks. And then we have to do, deal with the problem of having lots of such uh, how do we build those networks, and how do we do those calculations? The calculations start to become pretty daunting. And you, you know that that number with 10 significant digits? The, oh, I wouldn't believe, yeah, I wouldn't believe that for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, but probably it must be believed because it was in there. I'm, I, don't, I don't remember. That's unusual, right. Normally we have one or two significant digits. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so that so that's but the. And uh, is, is delay it doesn't play is not so significant here. I mean, del delay of delay. what? Well, internal delay of a signal so that you get actually. In the nervous system. Well, but in the in cell. In the cell. Yeah. Um, well, there is summation across the dendrites. Right, and delay there is very important. Yeah. And we're just talking about a model at the at the. speaking, this is rapid, right? I mean, well, no, we're just building a model at the cell yeah. body okay. at the soma, okay? Right. And so we can actually extend this to add information about the dendrites, but we haven't done that here. Yeah, sure. yeah. Right, that would be more free parameters. I think the answer to this question is that the chemical process. Oh, I see. Is that the question you're asking? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so any more question before you get something to drink and relax for a moment? <laughs> okay, so we'll stop there. Let's take a bit of a breather, come back, and then we'll uh, uh, have another tour through neuroethology, uh, networks, and interesting uh, a different animal model system and uh, arrive at a point where uh, we can perhaps use these techniques to answer some interesting questions in terms of brain and behavior. Okay, thanks. <laughs>